Hey, Bonnie. How, howdy, gentlemen. How are we? Very well. How are you? Doing well. Thank you for just being patient with me. I was just finishing off something else. So, yeah, I guess we'll get straight into it. Tell us, tell us about what you do and, and how you came to do it. Perfect. Well, <clears throat> thank you for both working for One Tree Planted. I am really, really proud of all of the work that they've done. And I've planted close to 5,000 trees just through uh, setting up a little portal through them and obviously done a lot of other <clears throat> tree related and conservation projects. But 5,000 trees is a, a, a pretty good effort just for One Tree Planted from our contribution. And um, yeah, I can, uh, I, I can just give you an overview of the, the story thus far. Uh, I think it's out of respect to my dad. I think it's, I was like starting with, with his true exploration back in the eighties. Um, he is the first person in history to ski to both the North and the South poles on incredibly hardy expeditions, especially the South pole trip. They had to spend nine months wintering over in Antarctica um, and then spent 70, 75 days on ice, uh, 900 nautical miles um, skiing to the South Pole, totally unsupported, uh, no depot supplies, no radio, no, no satellite phone, just a compass, a sextant and a watch. If they broke their leg, they would be left for dead by their teammates and they would have had to have continued if they had screwed up uh, the, the navigation, even by 0.5 of a degree, they would have walked around in circles looking for the South Pole and sure enough, not found it and uh, promptly died out in the middle of Antarctica. So he was inspired by the even truer explorers, the uh, Scots, Amundsen, Shackleton, uh, the pioneers who went off the edge of the planet, uh, not knowing what was there. You know, it's um, like Magellan and and these these oceanic explorers who were literally vanishing into the into the void off the edge of the map, totally, obviously for national pride and for 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 recognition, but for that pure state of of curiosity, I believe. Uh, uh, Captain Scott's quote, you know, it's uh, when he got down to Antarctica, it's he said it's uh, refreshing to know that there's still wild corners to our dreadfully civilized world. And he said that in 1905. So imagine what he would say right now in 2020. And uh, so dad uh, made these expeditions happen and then skied to the North Pole and uh, really touched uh, climate change, uh, early signs of what we're experiencing now. He walked under the hole in the ozone layer the year it was discovered in 83. Uh, his, he got, his face got blistered off, his eyes changed color from the UV damage. And uh, when he wow. skied to the North Pole, he uh, experienced sea ice melt four months before it ever had. And by 2050, uh, it's going to be actually impossible to ski to the North Pole. No one will be able to do it because there just won't be any ice there in, in the summer unless you're crazy enough like uh, Mike Horn to attempt to do it in winter, which is just madness. Um, summer Arctic, high Arctic expeditions are going to become near impossible. So pretty insane to think of, of that transition just in his life um, from being able to ski to the North Pole uh, to, to, yeah, in the, in the near future, that's not going to be possible. And, and really experiencing these things firsthand has drawn him to protect Antarctica and leave it as a land for science and peace. Right now, a global treaty protects Antarctica is uh, 14 countries which have laid claims down there with base camps but fundamentally it is not owned by anyone it's double the size of australia 14 million square kilometers um to put that into perspective it's 13,400 times the size of singapore and um 90 of the world's ice is there 70 percent of the world's fresh water is locked in that ice and it has the capacity to change our planet more so than any anywhere else in the world. So I've been under the guise and under the influence of my father since a young age and, and been helping him out since I was 17 with expeditions. I went down to Antarctica when I was seven with him as well, but 17, I, uh, on a yacht, I went down there at seven, which was definitely a bit of a blaster. I remember vomiting in a bucket, which had a smiley <laughs> face at the bottom of it, uh, round, uh, going through the Drake's Passage. And um, yeah, dad's been on this mission and taking people down to Antarctica, really promoting um, renewable energy and 
just trying to accelerate the conversation and the awareness of what's going on down there. And um, come 2017, uh, I really wanted to do an expedition that was different, uh, but really honored his polar legacy. And so uh, for two years, we, we put together the first ever renewably powered expedition to the South Pole. Uh, we had NASA designed solar ice melting systems that could melt uh, snow into warm water in six hours, uh, just using the power of the sun with this uh, space box flask, uh, which had uh, food grade silica on top of these little um, uh, heating element, and uh, it would just yeah melt melt snow into warm water, which was pretty amazing. First first of its kind that was portable. Uh, we had biofuels made from waste in Bangalore, India. Uh, we had um, a vacuum flask that used just the power of the sun to make slushy water and uh, a lithium batteries to power our, our, our um, solar lithium batteries to power technology. And we did have satellite phones because uh, we had to, had to play it safe. And um, so in uh, end of 2017, we set off on that thousand kilometer expedition, myself, my father, Carlo Donahue and Martin Barnett. And it was uh, yeah, a pretty surreal moment. I've been to Antarctica nine times, but never to experience that internal 360 panorama of ice in every direction. It was just a whole nother beast. Well, it's it was, going it, through your mind when you're kind of setting out on a, on a journey like that and say you get a day into it and you just have this kind of vast endless landscape ahead of you and that's all you can see and you know that just for the next month or so that's all you're gonna be doing is going across that landscape two two months it was a uh, i was out there for 58 days 65 days total in antarctica 24 hour daylight which really throws you off but those first couple of days it's immensely, immensely overwhelming, to be honest, because the sled's as heavy as it's going to be. It was 100 kilos when we started. And you're like, shit, this thing is heavy. Like my knees are sore on day two. And you've got 50, 56 more days to go. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it was a bit but, heavier too, wasn't it? Like, I think yeah. I remember saying that because of all the renewable stuff that you were using, that it was actually yeah, like that, 20 kilos heavy or something. Yeah, it was about 20 kilos heavier than it should have been. Um, pull it, pulling, that- pulling all of the solar panels and the, uh, the systems and everything. So it really was a lot harder than, than what it should have been. Um, so it's a hundred kilos and each one of you has one of those hundred kilos sleds. Yeah. And, uh, we had two of the solar ice melting systems, um, which could do six liters of water during the day each. Mm. Um, and obviously carrying extra water because you've got the water in there and you don't, and you don't just normally, you normally carry two to three liters of water and then rehydrate as you stop and camp every day, but we're carrying more water cause it's melting. And yeah, the whole thing was just heavier. Um, but progressively as we carried on, um, it became apparent that my dad at the ripe old age of 62 was really starting to struggle. Um, the, the sled was heavy just everything was hurting on his hip. His hip was wearing out. Uh, and uh, two weeks into the trip, he, he skied up to Carl, myself and Martin and said, gentlemen, can you make it to the pole? And uh, we said, yes. And um, he, he said that he just didn't have it in him. So halfway, uh, there's a, a place called Thiel's Mountains, which has a little fuel depot for the, the Basilers, the Canadian pilots who, who do wonders down there. And um, he got airlifted out and myself and Martin uh, and Kyle continued that journey and finished, uh, finished it. But um, it was a, definitely a, a, a challenging moment for him for having to abandon ship. And, and he really wanted to finish that with me and do a father and son expedition. But it was a very empowering moment to, uh, yeah, just well, all of the sponsors, the story, like that was all on my shoulders. And I had a, a huge obligation to finish it and going through your mind in terms of um like were you worried uh for your dad's like safety or were you just focused on getting getting the job done i was pretty worried for him he was definitely pushing it and we we did uh we would ski about eight hours a day nine hours a day 
And by the end of March, he was way back there because we had to keep the miles going. And so he would, he would be lagging. And like by the end of the day, he was sometimes an hour behind and, and he would have to catch up and he would be exhausted. And, and the last few days, he, his, he had the worst chafe, like really bad chafe. He showed me before he got picked up and he showed me, he's like, don't let this happen to you. And like, it was like <laughs> chunks, of le- chunks of flesh falling off, like proper, oh. proper manky stuff. And, um, you know, I think for him, he was just going through a lot of trauma as well. You know, he's lost two friends in Antarctica and, and in his mind, if he was in that situation in the eighties, he'd be fucked, he'd be dead. And so for him to actually have that safety net of an evacuation possible wasn't conditioned into him. So he was extra stressed thinking he was back in that situation and not having that safety net. And, um, yeah 45 days into that i really had a tough moment i had frostbite on my feet my my little toe was like properly black and like looking like i was definitely going to lose bits of it but hopefully not the whole thing and um yeah i think i think there's a huge parallel between really having those moments of like day two suffering day 45 suffering and even the last couple of days before getting there, when you're exhausted, it's in reach, but it's not quite there. And I think there's a lot of parallels between how people right now are managing being in isolation. You know, I think that the, the first couple of weeks of everyone being at home, there was a lot of support. There was a lot of people doing posts on Instagram and offering to help and giving home office tips and all of this stuff. But now that kind of bandwagon's gone down and yet people are still at home and it's kind of getting to that 45 day mark for a lot of people i think right now globally with people being isolated for as long as they have and i think for me even though my freedom and my circumstances were pressing i reminded myself of my freedom on day 45 when i'm looking at my toe i'm not wanting to put my boot back into a frozen ski boot that's falling apart and covered in duct tape and epoxy and and i've got chafe as well and i'm bleeding and my face is a bit black and i haven't showered for a month and a half and i stink my sleeping bag smells like piss because i fucked up and pissed in an early you have a wee bottle and i like (laughs) missed it now i've got a stinky sleeping bag as well and like the whole thing was kind of coming in on my shoulders and yet i remembered i was in that situation by choice and there's people out there who are in refugee situations, who mm-hmm. are living in extreme poverty, who are having abusive situations at home, who are they're, they're in a fucking war or whatever it is. <clears throat> they're in those situations, not by choice, but by circumstance. And they don't have that freedom. And yes, people around the world are really struggling right now. But I think it's really important that people remain grateful for that freedom that the West has for 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 what we will be reassimilating back into eventually. And, and I think that the, shifting that gratitude in hard moments is a really hard thing to do, but it really got me through those hardest moments. And um, how do you, how on do you, January 17th, I arrived at the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just how do you take that? Like, I'm just curious, in that, in that moment, you're looking at your feet, your toes gonna fall off. How do you divide? it between the the drive to finish because obviously i think anyone who does this has you know that thing in their mind that says i need to get this done right this is like you know this is a challenge i've set out for myself i need to accomplish it but then also all your training says i need to look out for all the signs that say like hey i might actually be in harm's way here so how do you make that decision like or like how do you divide those two mindsets in within yourself to say yes i press on or no i have to I have to call in the i gotta call in the helicopter to come pick me up it's a it's a really good question joe because i uh, i don't know if you know henry worsley he he was trying to cross the whole of the antarctic um unassisted he was 40 nautical miles out 50 nautical miles out from finishing and he didn't listen to those things he didn't listen to those signs and unfortunately his um stomach lighting exploded and then bile leaked into his organs and he died and i was thinking of people like that and and i think i think you know when you're getting to that point of 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 kind of march or die situation and i was i wasn't quite tickling that yet 
and I would have lost a toe, worst case scenario, but my life wasn't in danger. You know, I still was warm. I still had food and, and worst case scenario, I lose a toe. That was like what I was dealing with. I wasn't going to die. But when you are in situations, especially in the mountains, I'm a keen mountaineer. I love mountains. I love backcountry skiing and skinning and all of those, especially in the mountains when you're dealing with high altitude and you want to have that summit fever press on, let's just get it up there. Like that's when you people, people screw up and you end up being in a storm and a whiteout and people die because you do have that summit fever. So I think mainly it's dealing with your own ego in those moments and, and, and being aware that is this my rational mind talking or is this my ego talking and, and, and trying to defer the difference between the two and the thinking. I think that that's how you kind of get through, uh, yeah, navigating those moments of, of decision-making, really tough decision-making. What's come down to training, I guess, too. Yeah, right? how do you prepare for that mentally or physically as well? But like mentally, how do you put yourself into that mind frame where you're going to have to really be pushing yourself all day, every day, um, skiing X number of kilometers, burning X number of calories, um, I, I think long hikes for sure, doing like 12, 13, 14 hour days in the mountain with a decent weighted backpack, you know, that gets you into that trudging mentality. But to be honest, mornings, managing your mornings for me are key, like not waking up at 4.30 every morning and doing yoga every morning and being a complete Nazi about it, but being disciplined enough to, to not go back to sleep i struggle with my alarm every morning and you're like oh i just want 10 more minutes of snooze like and then you hit the snooze and then you sleep through your alarm and then you wake up at nine and you're frustrated and for me like managing mornings and being disciplined with sleep and 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 just being being i, I was doing a lot of travel um leading up to the trip and just managing jet lag and and all of those things, but for me, the mornings and the attitude of how you wake up in the morning was a big, uh, really helped condition my mindset. And, and just really, it, it comes down to attitude, you know, um, with the power of belief. Thankfully, the scientific community is finally catching up, confirming that it's not just a bunch of hippie nonsense, that the power of belief is immensely powerful to get us through hardship, to, to re-engineer how we're thinking and to create you know, um, uh, 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 an attitude of no matter where you are, even if you're taking out the trash or having to do yard work or whatever, you can bring that gratitude. You can bring that perspective into anything that you're doing. Even if you're having a really tough conversation with a colleague or you're dealing with lovers quarrels or whatever it may be, you can, you can shift that mindset. And, and I think any, any challenge is an opportunity to rise to that occasion. And I think just, really being aware of, of that mental approach was, is key. And, um, it was really tough, you know, January 17th, I finished this expedition, two months of skiing, two years of preparation. And I get to my goal and it's a ball on top of a candy cotton thing. And I'm looking at myself and I'm a bearded mess with frostbitten nose and like, my 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 goal reflected myself back at me which is a really solid mind mind screw around and um in an exceptionally anticlimactic moment if i may say so i think a lot of us feel that when we, we the honeymoon phase is over or you get a new promotion or you get your phd or whatever and then it's like what's next what is next instead of actually being in that moment of like yes i've done this it's like what's next you know and I definitely felt that at the South Pole. And, so why, uh, why do it? Uh, surely your dad kind of had a, diff, uh, a similar experience when he got there. And did he communicate that to you or did he have that experience? It, and it, and it, why, why do you continue to kind of do these things? And well, what drives you to do them? His experience was even more brutal. He arrives to the South Pole, is there five minutes, hasn't seen anyone for nine months. The base commander comes out and lets him know that his ship that was meant to be picking him up uh, has just sunk. So literally he arrives at the South Pole and he finds out his ship's just sunk. He's got 10 people who are there. They were gonna unload a Basler, little Basler plane and, and go and pick him up and bring him back to the where the ship was and then load him up and then take, take the team out and the base camp that they had set up near the Ross ice shell. 
And so he, he gets there. He's just realized his ship sunk. It's not insurable because no one insures a ship that far south. And he's just like, <laughs> what, what, what the, like, he didn't even have five minutes to appreciate it. So his, his situation was even more grim. But um, I don't know, to be honest, my dad struggled with that. That I think being a restless soul, you don't necessarily live a happy life, but you get a lot of stuff done. And I really hope that him transitioning to being in a different age bracket, he gets to really look back and be proud of what he's done and do things a bit differently and not just constantly have this chase of what's next, what's a new thing to do. And I think a lot of big business people and explorers, and I remember this guy, Devin, he skied, skied to the South Pole, God knows how many times, he's a Canadian fella, really good fella. And he told me at the end of the trip, he was like, just be aware that you might get a bit depressed after this because the, the, the excitement of, you know, battling through minus 35 conditions and to be doing all of this stuff, you know, you get back home and you're having your tea and you're like, well, this is, not, this is boring, you know, no, it's not, not the right word to say, but a lot of people do get that Under kind of, it, yeah, the, in, the itch. And then you're like, I want to go skydiving again, or I want to go do another mountain, or I want to go and get another business deal, or, you know, it's this endless search for more and and tying into what i'm doing now i'm i that that whole expedition was the launch of my nonprofit, the climate force challenge which is a seven-year mission to reduce 360 million tons of co2 before 2025 and fundamentally i'm doing that through collaborating with businesses students and just people on a lifestyle perspective to really accelerate understand what what they're doing right giving them toolkits to improve how they're, they're yeah, just managing, managing sustainability and really helping things like ESG, environmental, social governance strategies for businesses and net positive commitments and, and really giving you know, steps to understand our impact, reduce our ongoing impact and then offset, clean up the rest. And that, that, that whole inspiration to do that, I, I think, really is summed up by that that thirst for 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 more you know i i, I coming back at the one of the best questions i've ever been asked doing a keynote presentation was by a student in singapore and and he he stood up he's only about 16 17 and he said what's the parallel between circular economy and self-realization and i was like my man you get it because that is it you know what 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 within the circular economy it's about not constantly looking for outside resources to keep feeding the system it's about dealing with what you have and repurposing remanaging waste and 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 creating assets out of things that we already have around us and closing that loop and the same with self-realization you know if you're constantly looking for that externality the next festival the next holiday the next lover the next fancy car the next thing the next iphone if you're constantly looking for that next thing to make you feel at ease that 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 is a you know a never-ending that's a never-ending quest you know it's like oribus going around eating your own tail and just time and time again and i think that both with the circular economy and getting people to self-realize we've just really got to deal with what we have and by no means use that as, a, as an excuse to be passive and lazy, but to, to operate how we're doing business and how we condition our beliefs and just being and working from that instead of constantly snatching for what is more. And yeah, that probably sounds incredibly arrogant for someone who's sitting in a really hard done by situation in India or a favela in Rio or, you know, back end town in, in the middle of Mozambique or something like that. They'd be like, who the fuck are you to say that? You don't know what it's like to, to, to live on a, in a tiny apartment with six other people and all of this stuff. And, and I get that. I'm not trying to be, uh, that it is a Western luxury to even be having this conversation because not having a phone and not having a car and not having a place to live and not knowing where your next meal comes from, you know, that survival, that survival instinct kicks in. But at the same time, you know, I've seen a lot of people in impoverished countries who are far happier than hedge fund managers in America and far happier than VCs who are managing all of this stuff because they are, they 
are just living in that presence. They're living in whatever they're doing instead of constantly thinking of the 400 Google Docs that they have to manage and the 600 freaking meetings that they've got coming up in the week. They're just there and they're with you and they're happy and they're like vibing with you. And, and that presence, um, Antarctica is definitely very much taught me that. And I'm really just trying to promote that through expeditions that I manage now. And I have three parts of my nonprofit integratable solutions that reduce our impact, restore big scale solutions that offset our impact and then connectable experiences that, that uplift and, and inspire us to, to be of service and to really just connect with the world. And that connection can be out doing an, an experience, going to the Antarctic, going to Kilimanjaro, going to Iceland, curating, you know, net positive journeys, but you know, fundamentally that shift needs to happen within ourselves. And, um, you know, especially in, in fast paced business, uh, I think it's just a gap that needs to be talked about more and needs to be promoted more. And, and I hope if that happens, people will have more sense to, to be more sensitive to what they're consuming and this, who they choose to be in their supply chain and might have the sense to whatever plant, you know, 10 trees to one tree planted next time they do a business class ticket for $10,000 around the planet. You know, it's only 10 bucks, but that's 10 trees, one tree on average that lasts 40 years to questions one ton of CO2. And obviously things like hemp do it quicker and a thing like a redwood would do it slower, but for longer. But on average, one tree lasting 40 years questions one ton of CO2. The average American produces 20 tons of CO2 a year. 20, 20 trees for a dollar each through one tree planted. That's four Starbucks coffees and you can de decarbonize the American public sector for, for four Starbucks coffees each. And yes, the people will say, oh, but well, all the trees live to uh, 40 years. And yeah, maybe 80% of them will live, but that's better than, than, than nothing. And um, <clears throat> I sometimes get questions about, oh, oh but, but offsetting and planting trees and cleaning up the oceans, it's, it's band-aid solutions for making an excuse that people can keep doing business as, as they see please, uh, as they please. And I'm like, no, it, it, it's a band-aid solution to stop someone bleeding out yes you 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 deal with the trauma and then you get them into surgery and you get them into to rehabilitation and then you fix the problem but you need to have an immediate band-aid solution yeah, and planting tree you need a tourniquet yeah. before you go into surgery right exactly and so that's I what i want to ask you mentioned the kid in the kid in this singapore and you do these thing you do that you and your dad do this thing that i don't know what dozens of people have done right it's just it's such a small number and such really an impressive thing so how do you take that experience and connect with someone in the flavelas in brazil who won't have that opportunity let's say and how do you make that experience that you got tangible when you're speaking to them or you're speaking to the person who's i don't know who's disabled or differently abled however you want to say it how do you make that connection with them? Well, I can, to the second part of that question, the disabled, I'll, I'll answer that first in back, back to Hong Kong. I was, I've got, I've made a virtual reality film of skiing to the South Pole. That was another two bloody kilos of tech that I had to drag. Um, but I made a virtual reality 8K, 8K film of, of skiing to the South Pole, you know, climbing mountains, doing all of this stuff. And I remember I was working for Hush Tea Bar and it was basically talking about mental resilience in Singapore and Hong Kong. And uh, this beautiful, sweet soul, uh, he, he couldn't hear, he was totally deaf. And I put this, this VR on him and his, his just like his reactions and, and looking around and this other lady who was in a wheelchair who clearly had a myriad of things going on with her she put this VR on and she was suddenly there and she started doing sort of Tai Chi movements and like doing like crazy stuff with her hands and looking around and it was really beautiful. And that was an effort to share that experience, a story of, of caring about the planet and, and being excited to connect with it in a small way, even if it's just looking up at the sky, you know, I, when I'm in New York, everyone's down on their phones like these sort of like monkeys with the the necks and i'm like just look up occasionally like be aware of the sky above you you know don't need to go to the antarctic or 
climb Everest in your underpants or something, you know, we, we can connect with our local parks. We can connect with our local beaches. We can, we can find that connection, not at the, at the frontiers of wilderness, but, but even in our own backyards. And I think the relevance piece, it's a, it's a tricky one. You know, like I said before, talking about this is people would just scoff at it if they're in extreme poverty and talking about, the power of belief and, and, and reconditioning and all of this sort of stuff. But at the same time, if I take people on an expedition who are from Tanzania or are from Bangladesh or are from, from China, and then they can go back and, and help tell that inspiration, but be relevant to the culture, the language, and be a relevant role model more so than I can be because I'm a, I'm a foreigner. They, don't, they won't connect with me as much. I can try but fundamentally empowering others, giving them credibility, giving them the toolkits, giving them the story so they can go out and scale that message and scale the good news and, 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 and accelerate uh, through being more relevant than I can be. But I can be a catalyst to help them on that journey. Um, so you're two years into a seven year journey with Climate Force to um, remove, is it 360 tons? Yeah which is three days of global emissions, um, to put it in perspective. So how, how far along that are you? And like, are you, uh, that's still the target or? Yeah, it is. Um, even, if I, even if I get 60 million or whatever, I'm, I'm that, I, I've liked the 360 number. I think if you have, have a big, big bit of bait in fishing, you're going to catch the big fish. So hopefully I'm going to lure in some, some big, big ESG people and big investors and, 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 and help accelerate and accumulate their, what they're doing. Uh, but I'm about half a million or so more, hopefully going to be a lot more. I've just, um, working with a tech firm, uh, who's got a fund for 50 tech companies and about 25 employees each. And they're going to be all becoming carbon positive, uh, through a net carbon pledge so i've got some big things on the on the horizon but um yeah it's it is a big goal and i've definitely had uh some 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 very credible people being like are you sure you really want to commit to this and i'm like damn right you know i don't want three hundred and sixty thousand. like i would have been done by that already awesome. yeah and 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 yeah it's it's it is going to be a challenge, but fundamentally, I'm, I don't want to account personally for that reduction. I'm not claiming I'm the one solely reducing that, but I want to accumulate as many stories and as many projects and as many people who, in their own way, are accumulating that reduction. And then that can be, I can help accelerate that and just create a landing pad for all of these good news and 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 yeah re reductive reductive stories yeah so a big part of one tree planted's audience is younger people and obviously environmentally minded people um what would you say to them if they want to start their own non-profit or their local like a local grassroots action group they want to start a pickup litter club in their local community what, what would your advice be to them to actually go out there start doing it go to a tree planting event, whatever it is, just take action, don't just talk or don't think about it, go out there and do it. I, I would say within the actual creation, wanting to create something yourself, be innovative, but don't try remodel and create something completely new, you know, learn from what people have worked with, learn from the technology that's available. And obviously you can tweak and modify but I see a lot of young people thinking that they're going to change the world through doing something completely different. And yes, you might be that one in a million who makes that happen. But if you really just want to accelerate good impact, like see what people are doing. And that's what a big being a big learning thing for me is just to see and to learn and to collaborate and to then accelerate uh, in your own way. And because obviously we all have a different way of approaching it. So your uniqueness will shine through but from the get-go, um, unless you're building a specific app or doing something, just don't try and reinvent the wheel. You know, learn learn from what has been done and try and make it better in your own way. Um, and then in regards to actually making the impact happen, I think just just being a good role model. You know, I think people follow authentic 
good real leaders and that's what we need right now and i think just being open to 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 working with people you might not necessarily think that you would be working with you can't just work with just your friends or just the organizations that you believe in totally you know working with the 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 council or the the local whatever gas station or or the local bank or like I think a lot of these institutions can be viewed as evil and yet we're quite comfortable to go to the gas station and fill up our petrol and go and get money out. And yet on our social media, we're claiming that these institutions are evil and greedy and ruining the planet. We can't use these things and then cr criticize them. We need to be collaborating and working with them. And, and fundamentally they're all just people, you know, I've worked with Shell, I got a lot of criticism for working with Shell, but they are the biggest oil provider in the world. They have half a million employees and they have a huge reach. They have a huge influence. And if my own small way I can, uh, you know, I help them get um, V power fuel to become carbon positive. They're going to be planting trees for every V power fuel uh, in Netherlands and England and Spain to begin with. And that will be, that will be, that will continue to happen and hopefully spread. And I've done, you know, work with BNP Paribas, the bank, and they have a huge, they're doing some great work. And yet a lot of people just view those institutions as evil. And yet they're the ones who are holding the whole thing together right now. And, and yes, you have idiots like Trump and, and people who are really, you know, getting in the way of good environmental practices and standards, but fundamentally institutions and organizations are made up of people and people aren't inherently evil. They can be greedy, but they're not inherently evil. And if we can influence them to do things better and implement better standards, I would encourage young people to not point fingers, but to collaborate with those sort of people and not just to be preaching to the choir. Cause let's face it, you know, most of the eco documentaries that come out for the most part, they're going to be watched like people like us who are in the scene who like tree planting who like cleaning up plastic from from turtles mouths but it's the people who don't give a shit that those are the ones that we actually need to be helping and to be influencing and to be and to be showing the the good business sense and the the social ripples that can come from doing good how do we do that how do you do that if you're in the if you're in the boardroom with shell or bnp how do you, how are you selling this goal to them? I mean, if they're, if, if I am on the side of thinking that they are, they are evil, then I do think that they only care about the profit, about the profits. So what are you saying to them to convince them? That it's good business. That it's not, it's not just tree hugging, uh, nonsensical gr green, greeny stuff. You know, if you implement good ESG strategies, if you have good data on your impact, if you really do, care about your employees and their impact and you're planning 25 trees per employee to deal with them flying around the planet that shows good leadership and the 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 both the brand recognition like i said will will shine through and you'll be getting recognized as someone who's doing good your employees will be happy your shareholders will earn more trust with you and but fundamentally it's a, it, it especially with people who are uh, just blind with greed which they are out there especially in america i've lived there for seven years and my god some of the people i've met have just been very cringeworthy and and i think it's just shifting their mentality and realizing sustainability is not an option it's becoming a prerequisite and if you're not on this bandwagon you're going to be left behind and you need to be showing good leadership in this in this role for your business not just for a, th a philanthropy side sort of game like this needs to be embedded within your model within your strategy and i can help you on that journey sure uh, do you think it helps when um the ceo of shell ben van buren comes out and says we need to plant uh 50 or we want to plant 50 billion trees we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050 do you think like Companies like Shell, who, yeah, they, they are vilified by the public and like rightly so because they are some of the biggest pollutant companies in the world. But do you think it helps when the CEO of one of those companies comes out and says things like that and talks about the need for a shift to renewable energy? It does, 100%, Ben, but I, I think or Larry me, Fink, Larry Fink as well, right? The, the yeah. BlackRock guy. Yeah, and... and, and 
Jeff Bezos is getting there. And But what I would really like to see, and I've even said this in a war room discussion, as Shell called it, there was like 30 people on a webinar. It was a fucking zoo for six hours. But um, it, 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 I, I said in that, like, and I got completely shut down by this cr crazy lady, but I said it and I was like, you know what would be really good leadership? If you acknowledged that you haven't done as good as you could have like being vulnerable as institutions and as leaders of these institutions i think that's what people that's the next stage of being like yeah we have the net positive commitment and we've done this and we're planting trees and that's great but it's the next level of earning people's trust and to earn trust often we have to admit what we've done wrong i do think and, uh, consumers would um, perceive that kind of cynically though if if these companies yeah start to say yeah we haven't done a good enough job the i do think consumers would be like yeah but you've been making yeah, money off it. yeah I, I agree but like at the same time it, 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 there needs to be an accountability and without acknowledgement they can't be accountability yeah and and I know some people would view it as a media stunt to get more intention so they can continue to rip oil out of the ground or whatever but not just with Shell or banks or whatever, whoever, I think just generally, whether you're bloody selling condoms and you realize that you need plastic to make condoms a reality or you're a dentist and you use disposable plastic every day or you're in a construction worker and steel and concrete is pretty carbon intensive, you know, having that conversation and being upfront with your impact instead of just kind of brushing it under the carpet and being like yeah it's just business you know it's just business we're just going to keep doing business and and here's what we're doing good but i think that acknowledgement will will hold people accountable to 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 do better practices and be proud of doing better practices and then the people who are using the product or the service hopefully will be drawn towards people who are doing good and are talking about what they've done bad in the past but this is how we're responding and how we're rem remedying to do good now um i just think it's a huge a huge part of it you know that acknowledgement piece so that's interesting because it's a bit of a parallel there between the expeditions when your dad finally had to turn back after he wasn't feeling well enough right so like there's the idea that he has to now be accountable to someone and he's got to decide, no, I can't go forward like this anymore because it's not valuable to my team. It's not valuable to my family. So I have to stop and turn back. So acknowledging, Shell, Shell acknowledging that, yeah, we have not been doing things great. We have to turn back and we have to start doing things better now. And maybe I'm not going to stop what I'm doing entirely. Your dad's not going to stop being, uh, you know, not being in love with the Antarctic, but he's going to continue doing things that, you know, that are going to better the next time. Right. So it's an interesting Definitely. little parallel. Yeah. And I think it comes back to not just business, you know, owning our shit and relationships. If you've been a bit of a, whatever, like you haven't treated a lady with respect or you've been dishonest to a friend or you're, or you, you haven't been honest with yourself. You know, I think it all comes back to yourself being, being, vulnerable enough to acknowledge those things really is the first step of dealing with trauma and dealing with negativity dealing with with bad business practices you know if it doesn't get called out by yourself and by others nothing will change you know and that's you gotta take ownership of it good and bad yeah, yeah exactly and and i think <coughs> right now it's just so important that <coughs> we don't we're not we're not passive in how we're we're approaching dealing with racism and and women in inequality and and bigotry and all of these things if you see someone preaching these things and you remain passive and quiet in my opinion you're just as much a part of the problem i'm not saying you need to intervene every five minutes and be some sort of social justice warrior but there is a line of <clears throat> intervention that I think that is becoming increasingly important and obviously social justice warriors take it to the extreme and they can be irritating and no one likes that vegan who's criticizing someone eating eggs you know I really trying to 
reduce my meat. I have, I still have eggs and a bit of fish here and there. And, and some vegans would be like, Oh, you're, you're not doing it properly and you're still eating eggs and you know, the poultry industry and the fish are disappearing and all of this stuff. And I'm like, we, we need to be, um, imperfect, but also acknowledge that we're every day making an effort to be pushing ourselves and our communities and our families in the biz and our businesses and in, in the right direction and it doesn't happen overnight like earth days today happy earth day guys yeah, happy earth day it's earth day for you isn't it yeah from from australia and i always get this anxiousness in earth day that fuck what am i doing am i doing enough and blah, blah, blah. and i'm like dude every day should be earth day every day yeah. we should have that acknowledgement it's the habits earth. it's your day-to-day -day behavior that's yeah. actually going to make the impact if same with like if you're trying to lose weight or if you're trying to get into shape if you go every day and you have that one day off, the one day off isn't going to be as um, negatively impactful as, as the habit that you formed by going every other day. Exactly. And if you go to the gym and destroy yourself once a month, that's not going to be the same yeah. as, as going, you know, twice yeah. a week and being disciplined with it. Maybe we need 364 earth days and then we can have one day off. <laughs> exactly. I, mean, I would like an earth hour every day where people have have or uh, earth 10 minutes every day you gotta start that <laughs> yeah something you know where it's like <clears throat> build it into climate force yeah i i, I think i think yeah I, I i i mean meditation you know i think meditation and and the earth day need to be synonymous in a sense you know every time people are meditating just acknowledging the air that we breathe the earth that feeds us the water that allows us to drink you know we need to be respectful and to acknowledge and to be grateful for these basics because how we're treating our world will put those basics into question by the end of this decade uh, by the end of this century which is scary you know like what the hell is 2080 going to look like that like that scares me and 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 to put it into the other perspective you know my grandma is going to be 105 in on october it's a good effort she's when she was born, there was 1.7 billion people on the planet. Now we're approaching 7.9. And by 2000 wow. and 2050, there's going to be close to uh, uh, nine and a half billion. And by the end of the century, there'll be close to 12 billion at our, at our estimated thing. So go to go from 1.7 till 7.9 in one lady's lifetime, you know, what, what, what are we going to be like when we, if we get to 105? And I really want to be a part of designing a future that, yeah, is, is more sustainable than we are right now. Because if you think in those chapters of one lady's lifetime, you know, the Industrial Revolution was only 300 years ago. And look how much damage we've done. And if we expect our species to be around for four or 500 years into the future, you know, whatever jesus christ and the romans and like the the ancient uh, uh, egyptians you know that we're talking thousands of years and like god knows what our planet's going to look like in a hundred years yet alone another thousand years and i think it's important to think in regard regards to time we've only been on this planet as as civilized humans for 40 50 thousand years max and I'm saying I'm in a rainforest that's 90, 100 million years old. You know, this thing's been growing for 90, 100 million years old. And that's what we're, that's that fragility of evolution of insects, of biodiversity that does take millions of years to form. That is what we're squandering right now. It's not the planet. The planet will be fine. It will breathe us out and spit us out in one monumental breath if it chooses. <clears throat> but we are screwing with the fragility of what evolution has created over millions of years. And um, I just hope people are reminded of that. You know, I, I get really frustrated when people say, Oh, Barney, you're trying to save the planet. I'm like, no planet will be fine. It's our species and our species right to be on the planet is what we're, what we're up against. Yeah. It's powerful. And um, I guess we'll close it out with um, what have you seen or what have you experienced uh, or who have you met that's really given you hope over the last couple of years that we can we can make the changes that we need to make? The first person that came to mind is my friend Noah. He's the sweetest dude. And 
uh, have a few friends like him who are just very quiet vegans. They will never tell you that they're vegan, that the guy never buys leather. He never shops anything that has animals related to it. He lives in the forest. He's a farmer. He has some cats. He enjoys mountain biking. He has a van. He enjoys going on adventures and splitboarding and doing his thing. But he just gets on with it, you know? And he's not, he's not, he, he has an Instagram and you never know he was a vegan on that Instagram. But that sort of shit really inspires me that people just get on with it and they're not looking for recognition, you know? When, when someone's in need on the street, you just uh, talk to them for five minutes, give them the space, you know, don't, don't do good in exchange or having good return to you just do good for the sake of it. And that having that attitude more, especially in business and how we're navigating day to day life, that really inspires me that there isn't a, a bigger return and a bigger agenda for doing good. You're simply doing good because you think it's the right thing to do. And I believe that attitude, really really inspires me and i just hope to see more people who aren't preaching that their way of doing life is better because that just turns into another dogmatic war as we've seen with religion for, for generations but if you want to be spiritual if you want to be religious you go for it you just do your thing you don't you don't try and uh, you know evangelize people into believing what you're doing and same with the sustainability movement. And I believe more people like Noah who shine their light, who show good leadership, people want to follow that because it's authentic and, and, and inside you know that it's the right thing to do. So I believe that that, that subtle, humble and, and very down to earth approach of, of, of reacting to a conversation like this is, is really what inspires me. That's awesome. Yeah. Joe, is there anything else you want to add? Is there anything else that, uh, anything coming up, Barney, that you want to sort of plug? Well, I believe that three, uh, anyone listening to this, you know, we, there's two, two things I'd like to share. In regards to ourselves, we have three things that we can tr con control at any given moment, breath, posture, and intention. Any moment, wherever we are, we have control over those three things, breath, posture, and intention. And how we're approaching sustainability, we have three things that I believe we can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Shifting our diet, um, offsetting, cleaning up our travel, being more conscious about our travel, and just shifting how we're consuming. And, and that whole conversation of just not constantly looking for more and trying to, and trying to use what we have and, and be grateful for what we have. I think those three things, whether it's ourselves, the breath, posture, intention, or diet travel and shifting of our attitude towards consumption i believe those six pillars really have helped me and and i just hope that in in a small way they could help someone listening that's awesome that's great yeah. hey thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us today we'll uh we'll connect again soon in the future for sure no no worries gentlemen and um ben in regards to uh any video project you're doing or, or, or whatever, I have a plethora of B-roll and would be down to just help uh, That's awesome. yeah, just pl plug in some footage and some drone shots or what, whatever you want to just help accelerate the good, good stuff. You Thank you. Okay, cool. cool. Yeah, Have we'll connect. Day. Ciao, Cheers, gentlemen. Well, thanks.